Thank you. So my final lecture examines the role of archaeology in authenticating and challenging myths connected with sacred sites. I aim to consider how medieval sacred heritage is used to construct myths connected with nationalist and religious identities, to review the role of archaeology in authenticating and challenging sacred myths, and to re reflect on medieval sacred landscapes as contested heritage sites. So for those of you who've stood the course, I'm picking up some of the themes from Friday night's lecture. What are the dominant and alternative myths that operate at sacred heritage sites? And what are the tensions between them? I should begin with some brief definitions of what I mean by authenticity and myth. Authenticity has been thoroughly explored in the heritage literature and remains a core principle for assigning value. Keith Emmerich has commented that authenticity is an intellectual dead end in terms of democratic heritage practices. If we take authenticity to refer to traditional materialist approaches based on judging the quality of evidence according to academic criteria. He argues that the sacred cows of conservation, antiquity, fabric and authenticity, have outlived their usefulness and need to be rethought. However, his critique refers to the definition of authenticity as a construct of value defined by archaeological professionals. It's widely acknowledged that authenticity is culturally constructed and varies between social groups. To give you an example based in Scotland, Sean Jones has examined the concept of authenticity in relation to intangible heritage, which includes spiritual beliefs and related practices, artifacts and spaces. She explores this theme in relation to the Hilton of Cadball Cross Slab, a Pictish sculpture dating to circa 800. She reveals the strong local attachment to the object and the sentiment that it's a living thing, a member of the community, and integral to the local landscape and sense of place. Removal of the slab from its original setting has created tensions between the local community and national heritage agencies. The Hilton of Cadball case demonstrates how local voices may conflict with heritage managers and lead to the rejection of professional authority. Jones concludes that authenticity is not about the status of the objects themselves, but rather about social relationships between people and things, a means for people to negotiate their own place in a complex world. What do we mean by myth? The term is often used pejoratively, implying a false story or superstitious belief. But myths are integral to sacred narratives, representing our relationships with ancestors, the supernatural and the natural world. Archaeologists in Britain have long been wary of engaging with myth and folklore, even when investigating sites steeped in legend. Religious scholars employ the word myth more neutrally to describe a significant story, making no value judgments about its truth or veracity. Myths are seen as an ongoing narrative, the process of storytelling as a constantly evolving feature of religion. I am particularly concerned here with origins myths and how they relate to medieval sacred sites and the nationalist and religious narratives associated with them, what we might term golden age stories. Nationalist narratives look to sacred sites to embody the golden age, a time when a nation was most heroic and authentically itself before religious conversion, military conquest or mass migration. The most powerful evocations of nationhood bring together religious and secular power. For example, landscapes of sacral kingship such as Tara, the traditional seat of the kings of Ireland, and Gamla Uppsala in Sweden, burial place of kings and cult center of Old Norse religion. Archaeologists were active in forging nationalist connections with monuments and landscapes in the 18th and 19th centuries, but nationalist myths have continued to interact with archaeological scholarship in the 20th and into the 21st centuries. At the sacred sites of Whithorn and Glastonbury, archaeological research agendas were shaped by religious myths. Both sites are promoted as the cradle of Christianity, in Scotland and England respectively. 
Saint Ninian was first documented by Bede circa 731, but he's popularly, popularly regarded as having founded Whithorn, Candida Cassa, in the early 5th century. Glastonbury's claim to religious primacy is based on the legend, legend of the old church, first recorded in the 10th century and by the 14th century regarded as the earliest church in England, believed to have been founded by Joseph of Arimathea in the 1st century. But you're all experts on that now, so you've got that background. The sacred narratives attached to these sites have frequently clouded interpretation of the archaeological evidence. From 1957 to 67, Roy Ritchie excavated a series of graves near the high altar of the Cathedral Church at Whithorn. The leading church archaeologists of the day assembled at Whithorn to pronounce their views on the sequence, Stuart Cruden, Raleigh Radford, and Charles Thomas. They believed that the graves spanned a period of 1,000 years, connecting Ninia's Candida Casa with the late medieval cathedral priory at Whithorn. They published interim statements claiming a late Roman cremation cemetery, as well as early Christian burials. In his recent reassessment of Ritchie's excavations, Christopher Lowe describes their collective views as, quote, a suite of unsubstantiated claims relating to the origins of the site. Notice I've quoted that very specifically. <laughs> he suggests that Ritchie's failure to publish the excavations may actually have been caused by his inability to reconcile the archaeological evidence with the claims made by these very senior and influential figures. Fresh analysis and radiocarbon dating confirms that the Whithorn graves span a period of 400 years, beginning in the 12th century. They have no bearing on our understanding of Whithorn's origins or the story of Ninian's foundation. Lowe concludes that the complete absence of first millennium material from Ritchie's excavations should lead us to reassess the relationship of the medieval cathedral priory with the preceding Northumbrian ecclesiastical settlement. The figure most closely associated with excavations at Glastonbury Abbey is Raleigh Radford, who excavated at the site from 1951 to 64. As well as his involvement with Glastonbury and Whithorn, he excavated at numerous sites in southwest England, Scotland, Ireland, and the Isle of Man. Radford was a committed Christian, describing himself as high Anglo Catholic. He presented the Abbey's archaeology within a Celtic framework, although he acknowledged that his excavations at the Abbey had discovered virtually no evidence for a religious community earlier than the 8th century. But this absence of evidence didn't deter him. He described a Christian community at Glastonbury, quote, in Celtic times, and considered the abbey as one part of the holy city of the Isle of Avalon. Radford also projected the Celtic Golden Age narrative onto Glastonbury. In 1962, he deliberately searched for Arthur's grave at Glastonbury Abbey, using medieval accounts to identify the approximate location in the cemetery. He located a large pit and reported to the press always a bad idea, <laughs> that this was the exhumation site of 1191, where the monks of Glastonbury claimed to have found the remains of Arthur and Guinevere. He argued that the hole had been dug out and then shortly afterwards refilled in the 1190s. The evidence for his precise dating was based on the presence of chippings of dolting stone, which Radford supposed was first used at Glastonbury in rebuilding the Lady Chapel shortly after the fire of 1184. At the base of the pit were two kissed graves that Radford believed to be 6th century in date. He claimed that the kissed graves and the dolting stone providing dated, provided dating evidence for the supposed grave to be 6th century or later and the exhumation event to be around 1190. So he believed he had very precise evidence. These dates fitted with the documented date of the alleged exhumation of Arthur by the monks in 1191 and the approximate date of the legendary king's death in the 6th century. In an interview with a local newspaper, Radford is quoted as saying, I have always been one of the historians who believed Arthur to be an historical character, and today I have added additional proof. His findings were widely reported and accepted as conclusive evidence by the media, who in the 1960s displayed a touching confidence in the value of experts. Quote, to the untrained eye, the discovery means nothing, a patch of dark earth with a few stones protruding. 
But my reassessment of Radford's archaeological archive has challenged his dating evidence and refuted the identification of Arthur's grave. And the important point here is the, um, this layer of, of green here, which is taken to be a 10th century horizon of, of dumped clay. And the um, kissed graves that Radford was talking about, that he assumed were 6th century, have actually been dug into this 10th century horizon. So we know that they're later than the 10th century. And similar burials excavated at nearby Winchester Cathedral and Wells Cathedral have been dated to the later 11th century on stratigraphic grounds. We also know that the, the dolting stone um, that Radford used as, as a dating device is now recognised to be the principal building material used in all phases of Glastonbury Abbey, including among the Anglo-Saxon carved stones from the Abbey. So it was certainly used before the rebuilding of the Lady Chapel in the, in the last decade of the 12th century. So fresh analysis of the archaeological archive and also our, our wider understanding of the currency of the use of stones and certain types of burials confirm that the feature Radford located in 1963 was merely a pit and not a grave. At Glastonbury and Whithorn in the mid-20th century, archaeologists were concerned first and foremost to authenticate origins myths the stories that connected sacred sites to a golden age of saints and heroic kings. Today, interestingly enough, the pendulum has swung the other way, with archaeologists more likely to argue that early monasteries had their origins in secular royal settlements. Archaeological evidence has also been harnessed by faith communities to authenticate the spiritual authority of sacred sites. Glastonbury, Walsingham, and Iona were all reinstated as sacred sites in the 20th century, with archaeology and material replication playing different roles in each case. The village of Walsingham in Norfolk is known as England's Nazareth. It was the site of a major medieval shrine to the Virgin Mary, second only to Canterbury as a destination for medieval pilgrimage in England. Souvenirs of Walsingham are amongst the most numerous examples of surviving medieval pilgrims' badges and ampullae. The cult was sparked by a vision of the Virgin Mary, who appeared in 1061 to a wealthy Anglo-Saxon widow, Richelda de Faverche. The Virgin instructed Richelda to build a wooden replica of the House of the Annunciation, the site where the Virgin was visited by the angel Gabriel, who brought news that she carried the Christ child. The replica holy house at Walsingham was believed to be modelled on the precise dimensions of the original in Nazareth, reproducing a biblical space in medieval Norfolk. An Augustinian priory was built on the site in 1153, and a wayside chapel for pilgrims, known as the Slipper Chapel, is located two kilometres from the village. The Slipper Chapel was the first site in Walsingham to be restored as a focus for Catholic pilgrimage. It was purchased in 1896 by a wealthy local heiress, Charlotte Boyd. It emerged as a major site of pilgrimage in 1934 when it was declared the Catholic National Shrine of Our Lady in a national pilgrimage attended by at least 10,000 people. But a rival Anglican shrine was established in 1931 by Walsingham's High Anglican priest, Alfred Hope Patton. He secured land in the village and built his own replica of the Holy House. Patton's writings acknowledge the fierce competition between the Anglican and Catholic shrines throughout these years. The Catholic shrine was located at the original Slipper Chapel, an authentic medieval locale associated with the cult of Walsingham. Patton's shrine had no direct spatial association to the medieval site of the Holy House. Instead, he created a sense of authenticity through replication, using architectural reconstruction and incorporating medieval spolio, or reused fragments. He collected 170 fragments of medieval carved stones from the sites of dissolved medieval monasteries and incorporated these within the walls of the new holy house. These stones were not from Walsingham, but that didn't matter. They were medieval and monastic, so their materiality lent a borrowed sense of authenticity to the new shrine. In digging the foundations for his replica, Patton claimed that he had found archaeological evidence for a holy well associated with the medieval holy house. 
he reconstructed the well next to his replica house, implying that it occupied the original space of Richeldus' building. So archaeology was used very directly to authenticate his claim. Perhaps the most interesting case of medieval replication is that of Iona, where the Iona community was established in 1938 by George Field and MacLeod. MacLeod was Oxford educated and heir to a baronetcy, but he was ordained as a Church of Scotland minister and developed a lifelong concern with social inequality, pacifism, and ecumenicalism. His ministry in Govan during the Depression of the 1930s brought him into direct contact with the most austere poverty and social deprivation. His goal was to train ministers in a different way of thinking, to bring them together with working men in a common goal. His vision focused on rebuilding the monastic cloister of the medieval abbey of Iona, with the shared labour of reconstruction <coughs> shaping a new religious movement. Iona had attracted artists, writers, and antiquaries from the late 18th century. The Abbey Church had been restored in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and the monastic ruins were given by the Duke of Argyle into the care of the Iona Cathedral Trust on the condition that they were used for worship by all denominations. MacLeod persuaded the trustees to permit him to reconstruct the Abbey buildings, and he collected the funds and personnel to enable his vision. He recruited young ministers, while a master mason, Bill Amos, who's shown here, convinced skilled craftsmen to spend their summers in Iona working alongside the ministers. You can see the before and after here. The restoration was carried out to the design of architect Ian G. Lindsay and took place over summer months from 1938 to 1965. The Abbey's medieval buildings were well preserved, Parts of the East Range and the refectory stood intact almost to the level of the wall head. Only the West Range was a completely modern addition and did not reuse medieval footings. Today, the church and monastic complex appear deceptively homogenous due to the consistent use of the same local building materials over all these rebuildings. MacLeod was interested in the spiritual authenticity of place and the physical act of reconstruction rather than specific details of archaeology. He was influential in framing Iona as a thin place, a concept that has become central to the Celtic spiritual revival. This refers to the idea that the veil is thin between this world and the next. <coughs> MacLeod manipulated historical and archaeological evidence to support his version of Iona's past, with apparently little challenge from the academic community. Archaeology came surprisingly late to Iona. Limited recording had taken place in relation to clearance operations in the 1870s and architectural conservation in the 1940s. But the first serious excavations did not take place until work for the Russell Trust, led by Charles Thomas from 1956 to 63. Turning back to Glastonbury, reinstatement of the sacred site revolved around archaeology, so very different from Iona, there were no efforts to reconstruct or replicate medieval fabric. The site was offered for sale in 1906, featuring the monastic ruins and the landscape park of Abbey House, a gentleman's residence built in 1830. The site was purchased for the Church of England by the Diocese of Bath and Wells for the sum of £30,000. And I think... I believe this is a unique case of the Anglican Church actively acquiring a medieval monastic ruin, one perceived as a national shrine that they wished kept in Anglican hands. Archaeological excavations were commissioned immediately to inform the site's conservation and interpretation. Frederick Bly Bond, architect of the Diocese of Bath and Wells, was appointed as the first director of the formal archaeological program, conducting, conducting excavations from 1908 to 21. The trustees intended the excavations to clear and consolidate the ruins and to trace the earliest Saxon and Norman churches. But the Abbey's first archaeologist had his own personal agenda. Frederick Blybond was intensely interested in the legendary history of Glastonbury, and he is regarded as a pioneering figure of the New Age movement. His investigations integrated psychic experiments, dowsing, and spiritualism, 
the belief that the spirits of the dead can communicate with the living. He developed his own interpretation of spiritualism, proposing that ancient memories from the unconscious could be channeled through the medium of automatic writing. Now, automatic writing is an alleged ability to produce written words from a subconscious, spiritual, or supernatural source. This psychic method gained currency in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, so it was fairly mainstream, with celebrated proponents including Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Bond sought two very different types of verification through archaeology. The first was proof of the site's connection with Joseph of Arimathea and his foundation of a church in AD 63, after historians had begun to question the veracity of the documentary sources. His second proof was more unorthodox. He used archaeological excavation as a method to prove the scientific value of automatic writing. This is best illustrated by the celebrated case of the Edgar Chapel, located at the eastern termination of the Abbey Church. Automatic writing suggested to Bond that the Edgar Chapel had an apsed termination, but Terribly disappointing, the feature was not confirmed by his excavations. Despite the absence of archaeological evidence, Bond showed an apsed chapel on his published plans of the Edgar Chapel, and he reconstructed the apse physically in the layout of the ruins on the site. In a book published in 1918, he finally revealed that his excavations at the Abbey had been an extended experiment in psychical research. And so the, this publication in 1918 was controversial enough to be discussed in Parliament that year. The Anglican trustees were surprisingly tolerant of these approaches, but Bond was eventually dismissed in 1922. His reconstructed layout of the Edgar Chapel was quietly removed, and the trustees appointed more traditional ecclesiologists to continue the excavations. Perhaps because of this controversial early episode, Glastonbury Abbey has remained highly conservative in its site signage and layout. <laughs> there is no reconstruction on site, not even to represent excavated footings. The ruins are dominated by the Lady Chapel, which remains largely intact. The chapel was built soon after the fire of 1184, destroyed the early church associated with the Arimathea legend. So you've heard the background to this story. This hallowed structure represents the sacred heritage of Glastonbury Abbey, its claim to authenticity as the cradle of English Christianity. And yet, there was no attempt to re-roof or reinstate the chapel in the 20th century, or even to explain its spiritual significance to visitors. Only those closely familiar with the Glastonbury legends would connect the chapel with the Arimathea story. So my question is, was this minimalism rooted in some sort of confidence that the religious significance of the site was self-evident, or did it reveal an early awareness of the contested nature of the abbey and the potential for appropriation of its archaeology? Multiple and complete, competing religious narratives are frequently attached to sacred heritage sites. Spiritual authority is contested, and tensions emerge over access for the performance of religious rituals. These themes have been explored at world heritage sites ranging from Stonehenge to Great Zimbabwe. At Stonehenge, for example, pagan ritual engagement with the monument has come into contact conflict sorry, with the preservation ethic of heritage management. Votive offerings of candles and chalked symbols are regarded as a conservation threat to the stones. At Great Zimbabwe, interpretation and access are framed by the dominant archaeological narrative of the site as an early international trading place. Eust Fontaine's ethnographic study of Great Zimbabwe reveals local understandings of the site among Shona-speaking communities, including religious specialists who claim to communicate with spirits who provide connections to ancestors. These religious spe specialists believe that the ancestors have turned their back on Zimbabwe due to desecration by archaeologists, including programs of excavation, reconstruction, and replication, and because traditional rituals are no longer permitted at the site. <coughs> Similar issues are at play for medieval sacred sites in Britain, 
which are subject to competing religious narratives and tensions over spiritual authority and ritual access. Early Christian sites such as Iona, Glastonbury and Lindisfarne remain highly significant to the Anglican and Catholic churches, but they are also beacons for Celtic spirituality and neo-pagan beliefs. The new Celtic twilight movement emerged in the late 20th century and in common with paganism emphasizes personal development and individual spiritual capabilities, as well as a focus on sense of place and interest in nature. Glastonbury, as you may know, has attracted a diverse variety of spiritual seekers for over a century. The Abbey itself draws over 100,000 visitors each year, but many thousands more are attracted to the wider sacred, sacred landscape of Glastonbury, followers of Christianity, Wicca and Druidry. The natural landscape is an important factor in Glastonbury's allure. The abbey sits on a promontory above the surrounding marshlands, and in the early Middle Ages, Glastonbury would have been a monastic island surrounded by water before the drainage of the Somerset marshes. A natural sandstone pinnacle, Glastonbury Tor, towers over the abbey and town. It's visible for 25 miles in all directions, crowned by the tower of the ruined medieval chapel of St. Michael. In the early 20th century, Glastonbury became the focal point for spiritual, creative, and esoteric movements. A holy well located at the base of the Tor attracted a group of artists and spiritualists known as the Avalonians. The waters of Chalice Well contain iron oxide, and as I mentioned, this leaves a red deposit when dry, and the red staining was explained through reference to the myth of Joseph of Arimathea. It was claimed that when he arrived in Glastonbury, Joseph washed the Holy Grail in the spring and Christ's blood blessed the healing waters. Glastonbury became a place of pilgrimage for Christian mystics, as well as a beacon for music and the performing arts. From the 1970s, it emerged as a magnet for the New Age, people seeking alternative lifestyles, drawn principally by the Glastonbury Festival. Glastonbury is rare in the English religious tradition in representing a sacred landscape, the key components of which are the abbey, the tor, and chalice well. It embodies the cult of topophilia, the belief that certain locations are inherently powerful. The light, air, water, and landscape of Glastonbury are believed to promote healing and creativity. Like Iona, Glastonbury is a thin place where the boundary between the material and spiritual is permeable. Many elements in the Glastonbury story appeal to currents in Celtic spirituality, such as the landscape and a personal quest for enlightenment embodied by the Grail legend. Alternative beliefs have developed surrounding the history of the landscape, and they are stubbornly resistant to contradictory evidence from archaeologists. <coughs> For example, it's widely accepted that ley lines were important in the laying out of the town. The physical terrain itself is regarded as having been deliberately created for symbolic reasons. Many believe that the landscape of Glastonbury Tor is shaped as a maze, or a zodiac, or a reclining goddess. Glastonbury is also widely heralded as the site of an early Druidic university and a prehistoric center of the goddess cult. These claims are widely promoted through web platforms and social media without the need for supporting empirical evidence. Glastonbury also appears to, appeals to the tendency in Celtic spirituality to celebrate a past golden age. This is manifested in a focus on the site's Celtic origins, the belief that Joseph of Arimathea founded a church of British Christianity, a purer form of native Christianity that predated the Roman mission to England. There's also interest in the Celtic connections claimed by the medieval monks, in particular that St. Patrick and St. Bridget had visited the monastery in the fifth century. Glastonbury's Arthur story also feeds the Celtic golden age narrative. Arthur was a Celtic king who fought off Saxon invaders, and some still regard King Arthur as a kind of messiah figure who will rise again at Glastonbury to lead the new age. Both Joseph and Arthur connect Glastonbury to an ancient indigenous form of British religion, appealing to alternative spiritualities such as Druidry and Wicca, while alternative interpretations of the landscape have attracted feminist exponents of the goddess cult. 
The town of Glastonbury is a multivalent pilgrimage site that has generated a unique spiritual services industry based on shops, galleries, spiritual therapies, and psychic services. These have been well studied by the religious scholar Marian Bowman, and she describes it thus. Depending on whom you talk to or what you read, Glastonbury is considered to be the Isle of Avalon, the site of a great Druidic center of learning, a significant prehistoric center of goddess worship, the cradle of English Christianity visited by Joseph of Arimathea and perhaps even Christ himself, the New Jerusalem, a communication point for alien contact, the epicenter of the New Age in England and the heart chakra of planet Earth. Now, this is where I do my research. <laughs> the spirit of place is reflected in its continuing appeal to pilgrims of numerous faiths. The Abbey attracts annual Anglican and Catholic pilgrimage processions, the Tor is the focus of Beltane or May Day celebrations, and the town hosts an annual International Goddess Festival, founded in 1996, in which goddesses process through the streets. This magnet for spiritual energy has also experienced tensions between religious groups. A poignant example is recent vandalism of the Holy Thorn on Wirial Hill the tree which is believed to have grown from the staff of Joseph of Arimathea. The legend of the Holy Thorn emerged in the 17th century and the tree was a symbol of contention during the English Civil War. It was vandalized in 2010 and repeatedly attacked until it was replaced with a grassroots sapling in 2012, which was immediately snapped in half. The identities and motivations of the vandals have not been determined, but both militant Christians and militant pagans have been blamed. This damage brought the community together in shared grief and disbelief. But it's important to understand that there are five holy thorns in Glastonbury, all believed to be descendants from the original thorn and periodically replaced with new grafted trees. For many in Glastonbury, authenticity is a relative concept. Ancient symbols are valued, but their historicity is not questioned too closely. Marion Bowman comments on how Glastonbury has become more ecumenical over the past 20 years since she's been studying it. But access to sacred space in Glastonbury remains highly contested, particularly Chalice Well, the Tor, and the Abbey with the Abbey exerting strong control over what is permissible within its bounds. In particular, non-Christian rituals are prohibited on Abbey grounds, although illicit pagan offerings, such as flowers and candles, are sometimes discovered by Abbey staff. Some local people complain that the Abbey hides behind its medieval walls and that these should come down to allow, <laughs> imagine historic England wouldn't be too impressed with that, <laughs> to allow open ritual access and free entry to the sacred site of the Abbey. The Abbey trustees are committed to increasing ecumenicalism, but they remain bound by the objects of the charity established in the early 20th century. To preserve the fabric and grounds, to educate the public in the Abbey's historic and religious importance, and to use Glastonbury Abbey to advance religion in accordance with the doctrines of the Church of England. A new interpretation strategy was developed in 2012 that stresses spirituality, both in the past and the present. This is a distinctive approach in comparison with other monastic heritage sites, which often focus on the economic aspects of medieval monasteries as the first global corporations. The Trust asks visitors to respect that Glastonbury Abbey is a Christian site. Non-Christian rituals are prohibited, but all spiritual contemplation is encouraged. There's growing experimentation with multivocality through temporary art exhibits and projects involving local artists, such as a joy tree in the grounds. However, the interpretation of the site and the educational program remain strongly rooted in the concept of authenticity, based on archaeological and historical evidence verified by experts. Authenticity continues to hold particular value at Glastonbury Abbey as a site that has been at the center of competing religious narratives for centuries. Authenticity is viewed as a deliberate strategy for negotiating the gray area between fact and belief, 
as the interpretation strategy states, and maintaining a neutral middle ground between Christianity and alternative spiritualities. Glastonbury Abbey's interpretation strategy acknowledges that new approaches are needed to present the complex history and myths accessibly and to explore the relationship between legends and archaeological evidence. The Abbey collaborated with the Universities of Reading and York to create digital reconstructions that tell the story of Glastonbury through the lens of archaeology, improving visitors' understanding of the spaces of the sites, their chronological development, and how they relate to the site's myths. The reconstructions focus on the Anglo-Saxon churches, the Lady Chapel, the cloister, the abbot's complex, and Arthur's tomb. Stuart Jeffrey has commented on the challenges in engaging audiences with digital reconstructions like these, which by definition lack a sense of materiality, time depth, and spatial context. He concludes that lack of authenticity is the central problem, which he defines in this context as a sense of aura, patina, and proximity that is attached to material objects. The immaterial nature of digital reconstructions makes it difficult for non-academic audiences to feel a sense of ownership or connection. Jeffrey calls for a more democratic approach to heritage visualization, involving co-production with local communities and a stronger emphasis on 3D modeling and aesthetic values to increase the sense of visual authenticity. The Glastonbury reconstructions involved co-production with the Abbey itself. The Abbey director stressed the importance of archaeological authenticity in developing these reconstructions. Accurate, scaled models were generated from archaeological base recordings, and lengthy discussion took place on every aspect of plan, form, and materials. This level of archaeological detail added significant additional costs to the project, but the desire for archaeological authenticity overrode financial considerations. There are key aspects of Glastonbury's intangible heritage for which no archaeological evidence survives. Notably, the old church associated with Joseph of Arimathea and King Arthur's tombs. Reconstructions were requested by the Abbey based on descriptions in medieval historical sources. We took the decision to represent Arthur's tomb through the medium of a traditional artist's drawing by Dominic Andrews rather than a digital reconstruction. There is the risk of creating icons in visually, visualizing intangible heritage, and digital reconstructions may be perceived as more objective than an artist's reconstruction. We use John Leyland's description of the tomb from the 1530s, archaeological evidence for the appearance of the church, and comparative evidence of surviving ecclesiastical fittings from contemporary churches. We chose to represent a particular event in 1331 when the relics of Arthur and Guinevere were visited by King Edward III and Queen Philippa. The representation of a specific moment in history may help to counter the timeless effect that is typical of visualizations. We also developed a digital reconstruction of the old church associated with Joseph of Arimathea based on the descriptions by William of Malmesbury in 1130, before it was destroyed by fire in 1184. There's a long tradition of visualization associated with Joseph's church, beginning in 1639 with Henry Spellman's Concilia. Spellman reconstructed the building with wattle walls and reed thatch, and a later phase with upright wooden planks. His images served an ideological purpose, emphasizing the primitive simplicity of the structure which served as a symbol of the early independence of the Anglican Church before the Roman mission to England. Spellman's images may have influenced later archaeological reconstructions, notably one by Judith Dobby for a publication by Philip Rotz and Lorna Watts, first published in 1993. Our reconstruction was influenced by archaeological knowledge of Anglo-Saxon domestic architecture and includes a nod to the features of early churches, such as double-splayed windows. The shape and ground plan of the reconstruction are based on the surviving Lady Chapel, which was built on the site of the old church in the 1190s. The only medieval depiction of the old church is on the, on the seal here. Oop, that's wrong. Just here. Um, this dates to 1171, and it shows the facade of a rectangular building with turrets similar to those of the late, later Lady Chapel. 
Before launching the new reconstructions to the public in 2016, we trialled them at a workshop in Glastonbury involving representatives of diverse faith groups, including Anglican, Catholic, Quaker, Buddhist and New Age representatives, or Community of Avalon, as they're called in Glastonbury. The reconstructions were all well received, with one major exception. The response to the reconstruction of the old church can only be described as shocked disappointment. All members of the workshop had expected to see a round church. We were initially perplexed by this response, but it soon became clear that these faith groups were familiar with a different tradition of reconstruction of the old church. While we were guided by historical and archaeological evidence and precedents, they were familiar with a reconstruction by Frederick Bly Bond, dated to 1939. Bond showed the old church as a round structure at the center of a palisaded compound surrounded by 12 smaller round structures or cells. Bond's image of Glastonbury in the first century was of an early British monastery as he saw it, following the form of an Iron Age village and showing the apostolic number of 12 cells. This image has been widely reproduced in New Age literature and has become the local symbol of the church allegedly founded by Joseph of Arimathea. The challenge of reconstructing Glastonbury's old church highlights the complex of authenticity, which can be informed by competing forms of knowledge and value, in this case, archaeological scholarship versus local faith traditions. It also illustrates the difficulties involved in democratizing heritage visualizations when multiple communities and narratives are involved. Our reconstruction was based on co-production, but with the Abbey as the key stakeholder, an institution which places maximum value on archaeological authenticity. It was only through engagement with the wider community of spiritual stakeholders that we became aware of the tensions and sensitivities around this reconstruction. Their response made it clear that the principle of multivocality was essential in representing the old church associated with Joseph. We took the decision to reproduce both Bond's image and our own. They're shown alongside each other in the new printed guidebook and digital reconstructions on the site. There's been virtually no critical reflection on how archaeology has been used to authenticate religious narratives and medieval sacred sites. This is in contrast with the extensive discussion of pagan engagement with prehistoric sacred sites such as Stonehenge and Chattel Hoyek. The archaeological study of medieval Christianity has remained outside social, political, and heritage discourses. As recently as the 1950s and 60s, archaeologists perpetuated myths at sacred sites to glorify Golden Age stories, seeking to demonstrate the saintly origins of sites such as Whithorn and Glastonbury. The archaeology was forced to fit a mythological framework, causing misrepresentation of evidence and leading to major delays in publication. Heritage practice has recently shifted towards more democratic principles that challenge the pillars of academic archaeology. Social value is increasingly regarded as more significant than antiquity, fabric, and authenticity. But these traditional designations remain important at sacred sites, where the authentication of early origins and the survival of original fabric are crucial in establishing the unique sense of place and the numinous. Tangible and intangible heritage are brought together at sacred sites, and authenticity represents a strategy for people to negotiate their own beliefs. The case studies discussed here illustrate how religious groups draw on archaeology selectively to authenticate their own versions of the past and to compete with alternative narratives. Replication was used at Walsingham and Iona in the 20th century to reconstruct the authority of medievalism, while at Glastonbury, the ruins and their interpretation were pared back to cautious, minimal presentation. Through their involvement with Frederick Bly Bond, Glastonbury Abbey learned an early lesson in how archaeology can be appropriated to serve alternative narratives. Glastonbury demonstrates that a medieval monastic ruin can be a highly contested heritage site, with similar conflicts over access to space and freedom to perform rituals that characterize world heritage sites such as Stonehenge and Great Zimbabwe. 
Archaeological authenticity remains an important strategy for Glastonbury Abbey, a means of negotiating an interpretive position for an Anglican site immersed in legends and which serves as a beacon for New Age spirituality. As a heritage site, the Abbey has been highly conservative in relation to the myths, wary of commemorating Arthur's tomb or the Church of Joseph of Arimathea. But this is changing. Nevertheless, archaeological authenticity will remain a core value for the Abbey because an emphasis on scholarship and empirical evidence sets them apart from alternative narratives at Glastonbury, or that's what they feel. Marion Bowman argues that the Glastonbury landscape is the key spiritual focus for the community of Avalon. New Age seekers are drawn to striking natural features such as the Tor with its contoured hill, hill uh, the spring of Chalice Well, and the miraculous holy thorn that flowers twice a year. I would argue that New Age interest in Glastonbury is equally concerned with Golden Age stories that lend a sense of deep time ranging from Arthur and Joseph of Arimathea to the alleged Druidic university and prehistoric goddess cult. The community of Avalon is not concerned with the archaeological authenticity of these stories, but they value the antiquity and continuity of Glastonbury, alongside its special qualities as a healing landscape and a thin place where the physical and spiritual realms meet. Glastonbury demonstrates that thin places need deep time. Archaeology provides authority for sacred landscapes and spiritual narratives. It also serves as a lesson in the cultural relativism of authenticity, a slippery concept in a place with five different holy thorn trees believed to descend from the staff of Joseph of Arimathea, and where archaeology has been used since the 12th century to authenticate myths of the Golden Age. Thank you.